<clears throat> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be presenting about Arvados. Um, this is a project that I've been involved with for for, for six years now uh, as a developer. So <clears throat> it's Arvados is a open source platform for managing data. Um, it's we've set up an instance to support biohackathon. Um, AWS has donated credits, and we were able to make this available for biohackathon. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this infer so this in right now the uh, Vados instance is actually available for anyone to use, um, although you need your account activated. So if uh, anyone is still interested in looking at it. Um, you can go to biohackathon.curie.com. This will go to the instance that we've been using for the um, for the the public sequence resource development. But it's a <clears throat> it's open. You can run things. You just need to come and ask me to activate your account. Uh, so, <clears throat> in a nutshell, what are some of the things you can do with Arvados? It's a data management platform, so you can upload and archive data. Um, you have several different ways of identifying collections of data by name, uh, identifier, content hash. You can put uh, metadata on, meta, uh, um, on collections of files that you can then query back later. Um, and you can uh, share things with other users <clears throat> in order to uh, you, know, uh, you can set, set sharing on, on your projects with other users to give them read or write access <clears throat> without having to um, get, get too complicated with, um, with sort of permissions, um, like individual file permissions. Um, you can, once you have data on the platform, you can run common workflow language workflows. Um, it runs <clears throat> in the cloud or on um, HPC systems, and so it will scale out computations across uh, nodes. It will start up <clears throat> appropriately sized nodes as it needs them. <coughs> um, and you can have more than one workflow running at once for multiple people. <clears throat> uh, and then what I'll talk about uh, sort of after I've gone through this our presentation about Arvados generically is the um, public sequence resource that we've been working on. And uh, what it demonstrates is Arvados platform, while it offers um, a web interface for managing data and managing executions, it also is a very rich API for uh, accessing the data storage and the computation that you can use as a foundation to build other applications. So we'll, so I'm going to talk about um, the public sequence resource we've been working on as an example of how uh, we were able to really get going quickly because uh, you know, a lot of sort of the incidental complexity of, of data management and, and execution was just already taken care of. So uh, during the biohackathon, well, this is this is the Arvados training. Um, the, we'll share the slides, uh, and then we're on Slack and we're on Gitter. Um, and these slides are, uh, I'll, I'll show you later, but these slides are actually right on the Arvados instance in the public project. All right, so here's uh, the the agenda. Like I said, we're going to go through some of the. Uh, cap go through some of the capabilities, how you do things in Arvados uh, through the web interface. Um, and then after we get through this, uh, we'll talk specifically about what uh, I've been doing for by Hackathon this week. All right, so, um, yeah, so I talked about this a little bit. Um, Arvados, the, uh, the project, the open source project, was a spin out from uh, George Church's genomics lab. Um, his uh, yeah, some of the bioinformaticians working for him <clears throat> about 15 years ago or something, you know, needed needed a saw the need for a data analysis platform, a data sharing platform, um, and so they sort of started working on an earlier, a very early version of this. Um, 
and all you know it's always been open source it's always been um you know in, intended to you know be broadly useful um so uh the company i work for uh now curie corporation is the sort of most recent iteration of a uh, commercial venture to support uh the development of arvados promote the promote arvados um we're a very small science focused company uh, all right so there's kind of three main pieces to arvados um the keep is our storage layer this is a content addressed data management system um this means all the data you put into it <clears throat> is um it's sliced up into little blocks and these are um referenced by their uh, hashes. And so when you retrieve a block, <clears throat> you request it by its hash. And so you, when you get it back, you can verify that you got the data you expected. This also means it's very easy to, to copy data or deduplicate data because you have a strong guarantee that two data blocks are actually the same. Um, we have the Crunch Workflow Manager. This is, is runs uh, common workflow language. Um, <clears throat> it's also, but it's based on Keep in particular. It uses, it leverages its knowledge of um, the content addressing and strong uh, immutable identifiers to be able to um, optimize things like reusing jobs that are uh, identical in the past. So everything that's run in the system has a record and it can look back at it, the history of things that it's run and avoid rerunning things um, that, you know, that are unnecessary, that maybe, have, maybe are very expensive to run. Um, so this allows you, this is really useful for especially workflow development where you might start a workflow and it'll fail halfway through and then you don't want to redo all that past job, past work. Um, so it'll reuse all that work and then it continue going. Um, and again, because it keeps a lot, there's a lot of record keeping. Um, we have, you have content addresses of the inputs and the outputs. Um, and so you have very strong provenance and you can track exactly what happened. You have logs of everything that ran. Um, and so you have very strong and reusability. You can also copy, uh, whole computation from one cluster to another and have very good um, uh, assurance that it will rerun the same way that you ran the first time, even though maybe you went to a completely different cloud, cloud provider or maybe you went from a HP system to a cloud system, it'll, it'll run the same way. Um, the third thing, I'm not going to talk about this much, but uh, we pro one of the projects being built on top of Arvados is uh, a genomic search engine called Lightning. And um, this is uh, based on the uh, idea of being able to take many genomes, um, also sort of slice them up into these uh, units called tiles, and um, then store genomes as references to tiles um, instead, of, um, instead of as like, uh, uh, you know, VCFs or, or raw reads. So, um, this is this is a product that that's still that's been worked on, still being worked on. But um, this is a specific, particular to genomics. Um, it allows you, it gives you a, a data format for um, doing things like machine learning and um, also very efficient storage and retrieval. All right. So as I mentioned, every everything in Arvados is an API. <clears throat> we have a web interface. We actually have two web interfaces. Um, I'm only going to show you one of them today. Um, and we also have a set of um, command line tools. We have SDKs in a number of languages, you know, Python, Go, R, Perl, sort of, Ruby, um, and Java. So um, hopefully your favorite language you could you can write um, you can write you know applications to start talking to Arvados very quickly. Um, and again, it's really easy to build, uh, you know, interfaces, orchestrations that 
that talk to Arvados or get data out of it. All right, uh, so keep. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, when you take a, a large file in, it, it you know, breaks it up into these blocks, these content address blocks. Um, these are stored on a set of uh, keep servers. The uh, keep server is it basically just stores and retrieves these content address blocks, and they can um, they they can then they can use uh, backends such as cloud storage um, or a file system like file system directory. Um, and then to describe a uh, to reassemble the file, we have what's called a manifest which is then a list of these data blocks in storage and a description of how to put them back together again to get your files back. And then the manifest itself, which is a, a text format, can, is hashed, and then you get the portable data hash. And the portable data hash is, describes uh, an entire collection. So uh, the unit in the, in the system that we usually work in is uh, collections. Now, obviously, a collection can be empty. It can have a single file, but it can also have a whole hierarchy of files. And, um, and we've had people have created collections with like millions of files. So this, this scales up pretty well. So yes, I mentioned, so we have content addressing, we have uh, deduplication. Um, one of the benefits of deduplication is that we can um, move data around by reference. Um, so if you need to copy, say you have a, co a collection with a million files, you don't actually need to copy a million files. You just create a new record that has a copy of the manifest and references all those blocks. And now you have you have what uh, is sort of logically a collection uh, copy of it, but you didn't have to move any of the real data around. So it's really easy to you know, again copy data, move data around, um, you know, make your own sort of changes, copy on write changes, um, <coughs> but you don't pay for uh, you don't have a extra redundant usage storage. Uh, let's see, as I said, manifests, you know, can scale very large. Um, so, you know, as the, the basic structure of the system is we have, you know, a manifest which can reference many files, and then we can have as many of these records as you can fit into a Postgres database. So, um, yeah, we have, you know, petabyte clusters, and we expect it could scale, you know, even even larger. Like many, you know, several petabyte clusters. Let's see. Um, yep. Yeah, so, yeah, as I mentioned, so collections, folders, and collections are organized. Yeah. So then we'll talk about projects. All right. So this is just an example in the user interface. Um, so you're looking at a collection. There's a, a if you look. On this page, there's a collection UUID. This is a database identifier for the collection. Um, that is a reference to a record. There is also the content address. So the content address is an immutable hash of the content, uh, whereas the reference to the record is a, is a thing that can be updated. So the, the name of a particular collection is associated with the record, not the content address. So if I want to rename it, I'm updating I'm updating um, the record by UUID. If somebody makes a, a copy of this, they get a new record. It has the same content hash, so the same content, but then they can change the name or um, add add their own tags or something to it. But then if somebody copies it and then changes it later, add changes files later, then they will that will change the content hash, and then you will know that those two records are no longer the same. Um, and on the right hand side is an example of like the, it's a JSON API. Uh, our web interface lets you access like API responses, um, you know, which is sometimes useful for debugging. So it kind of sh just shows you that 
So we, you know, there's lots of information available, and this is all available through, um, you know, through the, the different SDKs. All right, now let's talk about workflows. So uh, I think I mentioned some of this already. Um, yeah, so the, you know, again, the workflow manager, it's you know, designed for uh, provenance, reproducibility. Um, we have the entire provenance chain, which inputs went into which um, jobs, which outputs came out of those jobs. Um, we know, um, you know we can, like I said, we can reuse past work because we have strong assurance that um, none of the inputs have changed. Um, we can access the cloud. We can uh, we run everything through Docker. Everything has to run through Docker, so you have you know compartmentalized, um, you know containerized, containerized jobs. So you have good good um, reproducibility of running software. Um, and yeah, and here's the, yeah. So here's an example. This is an automatic provenance graph. So this is. Um, it um, so this isn't. It doesn't look at. It's not looking at the uh, workflow itself. This is just looking at the uh, the structure of the uh, round boxes are jobs, and the square boxes, the rectangular boxes, are um, data files. So in this, you can see there's the the first. Uh, job is run clinvar report and we were able to reconstruct just by looking at its um, execution record its container request record that we used um, this certain vcf file this clinvar vcf file and a certain and a docker image called arvados jobs and this produced a log file and it produced an output file and then that output file was fed into another job called run clinvar report HTML. And so then we got to get our, um, you know, get a report that somebody could see. All right. Um, so everything, so the database has a s various principal objects. These are record types. Um, so we have collections that I talked about. These can have data. Um, we have Workflows. This is um, a workflow that's that's a common workflow language workflow that has been registered with the system, so it's stored in a record to be uh, executed through the web interface. Um, but you can also run these just directly from the command line. Um, so a container that's uh, something that's actually going to run in the system. That's like a it's a it's a request to run a particular container with a particular set of input. Um, so we have groups and projects, uh, which we haven't really talked about yet, and then we have users. So these are the main um, object types you'd interact with the system. Um, I actually want a quick note about um, identifiers. Um, every identifier has three parts. It has a, a cluster ID, it has a, an identifier, a identifier type in the middle, and then it has the actual um, unique material. So the, uni uh, the unique string. So every cluster in Arvados has a five-digit alphanumeric um, identifier. This means that when, um, in our, when you see an Arvados identifier, you can look at the first five characters to see what, which Arvados instance that came from. And if you recognize that instance, then you can go and contact that instance to find out more information about this identifier that you've gotten. So this, this enables federation where uh, multiple Arvados instances can actually talk to one another because uh, the identifiers include the cluster, their cluster of origin. And so if uh, you, the software can reason about, okay, is this, identifier represent a record that I own or is it a record that someone else owns, some other cluster owns, and then I can go out and um, access that cluster. Um, and as I said, the second second part is the type of record. So it, it's, it's sometimes useful when you have identifiers to be able to know what they actually, what type of thing they identify. 
All right, so projects. All right, so in Workbench, um, there's a there's a um, button at the top called projects. Um, you can also create them through the command line interface called create group of class of project. Um, project is the unit of organization for these other object types that we've talked about. So, oh, so we kind of went through that really quickly. Um, yeah, so if you have a project, uh, your data collections, workflows, um, process execution of um, execution of workflows, uh, objects like that are all owned by a project generally, or owned by a user. Owned by a user. Um, and projects can own other projects. So you could create it. You create a hierarchy of projects. Um, use it as a unit of organization and also as a unit of sharing. So uh, you can share an individual project with other people. All right, um, adding data to the system is very easy. Um, you would go to a project and you say, upload files, and that'll create a new collection that you can upload to. So you choose your files to upload. So down here, um, you, yeah, you say choose files, you pick the files, you hit start, and then you'll get a progress bar as it uploads those files to that collection. Uh, yep. So, but and so anything that you upload, you can or you can upload and download also from the command line, which is very useful for scripting and orchestration. Um, and again, you can also upload and download from the SDKs as well. Um, so there's arv arv keep put that um, if you you know, uh, you say would say rf keep put in this example it's piping data from somewhere else and putting it into keep um, you can also rf keep put a directory you know a set of files or a directory um, it has a number of arguments a couple of useful ones is which project it should go in which is you give it a give the uuid of the project um, and also setting a name of the collection that will be created so when you use rf put generally it um, creates a new collection and puts those files in there. I think there's a, an update option as well that will uh, put the files into an existing collection. Um, and then there's a corresponding rv get, which downloads files from, um, so these are, these, are, these are Python programs that are command line, uh, command line tools that you can install with uh, pip, pip install uh, Arvado's Python client. Um, yeah, so you so again if you're working at the command line, you would use rv put and rv get to get um, to fetch data, to work with data. Um, let's see. All right, so um, an another feature that Arvados has is um, managing shell nodes. So um, it's Common that you'll uh, want, you know, you have maybe especially in the cloud, you want um, a node that you can use to interact with the services that's that's uh, on the same network of those services. So it's similar to like a, a head node on an HPC system, um, but Arvados can actually manage these uh, shell nodes for you. It will, if you create a user in Arvados, it'll create a corresponding user on the shell node. Um, and then those would be pre-installed with all these, uh, all the different Arvados tools. Um, all right, I'll talk about metadata quickly. Um, all right, I will. I can show this a little later. But um, on collection pages, there's a tab called tags. Uh, every every collection um, has a uh, property or has a field on it called properties. Properties is a set of key value pairs um, like JSON so they can be uh, have you know structured data under them. Um, but you can edit the, these key value pairs. There's a uh, structured vocabulary file on the server that will um, re can restrict like which which 
recommend certain keys and for certain keys restrict like what your uh, what inputs are available. Uh, the the advantage of using the Arvados metadata is it's included in the uh, string the string substring search. So when you do a search at the top of the workbench um, and it searches the entire database, it will um, include the the these properties in the records that it returns, and um, as well as doing substring search on these these metadata properties, you can also do um, filtering through within the API. All right, so yeah, so I mentioned so projects can be shared. Um, so there's a sharing tab over on the right. So when you're looking at a project, you want to give another uh, collaborator, um, you know, read or write access to it, you would go to the sharing tab oh, and you would add, uh, say share with a user or share with a group and then add that uh, user or group along with um, along with the level of access, which is read, write, and manage. So um, read obviously means they can only see things, they can't change anything. Write allows them to um, add and delete and move things. Manage is uh, the same as write with the addition of also being able to modify um, permissions. Like, so to further modify, further share something or change the sharing with, with somebody. Um, yep. So you can have a also have a group of users. Uh, basically, a group of users. Uh, you can give access to a project to a group, and then all the users of that group would get that access to that project. So um, yeah. So this is this is the page for editing users. Um, you can when you have a new inactive user. So as an this is a, as an admin. If you have an inactive user, you would do set up account. If you need to kick them out of the system, you can deactivate them. Um, if you sometimes uh, as an admin, you might need to debug what a particular user can see, or you need to act as a particular user. So there's like a login as it's sort of a pseudo. Um, and on the right hand side here, you manage uh, group memberships. So, um, so here's you know some some you know so this in this instance we have um, four four groups. We have an all users group. Um, we have an anonymous users group, um, and then we have two a science team group and a private data group. Um, the all users group and the anonymous users group are special. Uh, all any any user that is considered active in the system is supposed to be part of the all users group. The anonymous users group um, means that it's visible to non logged in users, so you can have data uh, that is does not require logging in to view. And so if you want to make data publicly visible, you share it with the anonymous users group. Uh, and then these other two groups are, are uh, well, just particular to this example, but then they're just regular groups. OK, this is complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not going to get too much into this, um, except that the group, the permissions in Arvados are a graph. So there's two different ways that permissions can be transferred. Um, if a so users um, can own projects, projects, uh, uh, projects can have other projects inside them. Um, if you, as a user or a group, own something, then you have complete control to that project and every project underneath it. Uh, so it's pretty simple. Like if you get once you have a, what if you have owner, you know, if you have ownership, you just have complete managed access. Um, but then we also have this concept of permission links, 
and permission links are much more flexible. These allow you to link access to deeply into a project structure. So in this example, user C has only been given uh, permission to see project two. Project two is under project one, which is owned by user A. By giving him a permission to see project two, user C cannot see project one or anything else. They, oh, that person, that user only has access to that project too. So it does, so this allows you to um, uh, structure, structure the projects, projects in such a way so that people can only see the things that they actually need to. Um, so when you're, when you're sharing, you can say, okay, I'm going to, maybe I'll create a sub project so that I only share with this user the, the particular things I need them to see. Um, without sharing my entire project, without sharing everything I'm doing. Um, what's, I guess, interesting is this sort of different from like a Unix file permission model where I can't share one directory that's a subdirectory of like, if I, you know, in my home directory, other users by default are not allowed to see my home directory. So I cannot create a, a folder in my a directory in my home and then share that with someone else. Um, we have to like, if we want to share something, we have to create it somewhere else where both, both users can see it. So here, this is simpler. I could, once I've, I've created something, I own it, but I can give other people access to it, even though to me, it's still underneath my, my home. All right, I hope everyone followed that. <laughs> okay. Um, Another feature is if you have uh, you have a file you want to just send a sharing link to somebody, you can use this uh, sharing and permissions uh, box at the upper right. It's um, you would say create a sharing link, and you can see it's already been created up here. And then that that's a link you can copy, you can paste it into an email, and give it to someone else, and that person will, will be able to download those files uh, from a They'll get a special page that says, yeah, here's, here's the files. Um, that is based on um, you know, having a secret embedded in the uh, link. So if you, get, if you create one of these sharing links, um, you don't want to, well, you could just post it on the internet. Um, but um, you, know, you, don't want, you don't necessarily want uh, just anybody to, to see it. Um, because that allows someone to download the data without logging in or anything. So this is an alternative to the sharing system that I just described. If someone is not using Arvados, um, but you still want to share data with them, there's, there's a way to do that. All right. OK, I'm, I, th I think uh, Michael did a. a presentation on common workflow language yesterday. Uh, I suspect most people on this call are familiar with it, so I'll go pretty quickly. But um, uh, so Arvados projects um, and, and myself personally are involved in the common workflow language from the very beginning back at, at the Bioinformatics Open Source Conference in 2014. So. Um, you know, we, we developed Common Workflow Language uh, specifically to kind of um, cut the knot of there being uh, workflow, too many workflow languages that are incompatible across systems. Um, you know, it's, it's, we really want people to be able to develop their workflows on whatever platform and then if they're, and then be able to bring it to another platform, you know, to run it. So, um, and I think at Biohackathon, that's that's really, 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 really come forward as being a huge advantage because um, as I've been working on the um, sequence down, uh, public sequence resource project, uh, a number of other people have been developing, independently been developing workflows that um, I've been able to then pick up their workflow and bring it over to Arvados with, with you know, little or no F, you know, very little effort, very, very few changes. And so this is exactly what we were hoping for. Um, 
and then these workflows could also be run on other CWL platforms. So, okay. So I won't talk about this too much. Um, you know, you generally, you write it <coughs> for whatever your, um, you know, you create a Docker, a Docker file, you build a Docker image, um, you add the Docker images, you, know, you add the Docker images to your CWL. Um, Arvados has its own way of managing Docker images, so um, we have a special uploader, this Arv Keep Docker. Um, Arvados CDBL runner also will upload the Docker images for you, so it's pretty convenient. Um, you put the Docker requirement in your uh, CDBL file. Um, yeah. Docker best practices, one yeah, one Docker image for each tool, so you don't have enormous Docker images that take forever to build. Um, so again, writing a workflow, you know, you write a CWL command line tool, um, you have a input YAML. Um, now in Arvados, so again, we in keep, Going back to the, the I talked about earlier, keep is content address. So here, so I mentioned um, portable data hashes for collections. So here's an example of that. So the this first file called reference, its location, it's located in keep. Then we have a portable data hash. So this is identifies the collection that, so this is a, a hash and uh, the size of the, um, after the plus is the size of the, the manifest. And then the, na the name of the file within the collection that we're referencing. Now, the, again, two interesting things, two really useful properties of these kinds of identifiers, these hash-based, um, these, you know, these content addressed identifiers. Um, they are immutable. If you get back a different content than what was hashed, it, more than the, the the content, the the content will give you a different hash than um, the one you are expecting. So you can validate it. It's sort of self self certifying. Uh, and the second, because it's immutable, you also get a number of benefits at its location independent. So. This keep reference, if I copy this collection to a different cluster, this keep reference is the same. I might copy all of my files to a different Arvados instance, and they might get different database identifiers, different UUIDs, because now these are records in the new database. But if the content is the same, is unchanged, this identifier is unchanged. So I can take the exact same input file describing my workflow, bring it to another cluster. If the input data is the same, the cluster will run it the same way, and I don't even have to change the input file. So that's really, that's pretty neat. Uh, yep, yeah, so just some, some recommend, so uh, some recommendations, things to do. Um, all right, running a workflow. So, um, <coughs> yep, so you can, so uh, there's Arvado CWL runner. You can, um, it uh, takes the CWL file and the input, the input object, the input YAML file. Um, this, in this case, it's this uh, suggested you can run the workflow runner itself locally. This, um, uh, avoids so there's it can run in different modes. Um, the normal modes when Arvada when you run Arvada Seed Wheel Runner is it actually creates a job that runs the workflow runner, and then that job submits further uh, further containers to be executed to actually execute the workflow. Um, although you can also use local mode, you can skip that first step of dispatching the um, a the runner job and then just run individual jobs uh, run the steps directly from your shell node or dispatch them directly from your shell node 
Um, yeah, so in like production, it says so you would um, you would want to you would want to run it in a project. You want to give a project UUID, um, so everything, all of the intermediate and output file and log files would go to a certain project to avoid sort of cluttering up one common um, directory or uh, uh, by default, things will go to the user's home project. So you don't want to, just like your home directory in, in a Unix system, it's easy for that, or, or, or your desktop or whatever. It's easy to get really cluttered. So you want to put things in a, pro in a project. Um, you can give your, this, this execution, this particular execution, you can give it a name. And if you say submit and await, it spins it off onto the cluster and then, it's uh, and then it then the command line tool will exit with the identifier of the workflow that's been submitted, and so now you can walk away and um, you know the the workflow runner the, is the shell node or or laptop or whatever you're submitting this from is not involved anymore and it will just runs on the cluster. So. Some flags is you can disable reuse if you need to rerun things. You can adjust um, resources. Uh, you can also set um, another feature is to set the time to live of intermediate outputs. So if you want the outputs to clean themselves up, you can say, okay, everything that was all the intermediate outputs, not the final output, all the intermediate outputs will like self destruct in 24 hours. And so then they'll just like clean themselves up. Uh, so let's see. So yeah, so so this is so describing some of the orchestration that you can do. Um, you you know if you have a, a sequencer, you know an Illumina sequencer. Uh, HiSeqX or NovaSeq, you can, um, as the as a analysis as a sequencing run is going, it's producing data that you know gets sent to a directory. Um, you can actually run RF put iter iteratively in a resumable mode, and it will upload all the files that are there so far. It'll remember what it's already uploaded. And only upload only re upload the things that are new, and you can run this like every half hour to continue sort of trickling the data up from the sequencer to your cluster instance. So when it's done, when it gets the signal that it's done, that can then go to your next sort of orchestration script that um, knows that all of this all the data has already been uploaded. It can um, kick off the workflow. Um, it, you know, it knows the collection that was uploaded to. It has whatever other uh, metadata from the workflow, like the sample sheet, or from the sequencer run, like the sample sheet. Um, and so it can then actually submit that to, um, then you would submit that to Arvados, and then you would start your um, your analysis running, you know, like BCL to FastQ and FastQ to VCF and so on and so forth. Um, Again, using the SDK to sort of um, orchestrate the interaction between the actual sequencer and the uh, the cluster that's doing the analysis. All right. Um, yeah. So things you can do with the Python SDK, you can. Um, so this is this first example. It's listing. <coughs> container requests. So, a container a container request is a request to run a container. Um, so, you would list. You would you would uh, get a listing, and then you give it filters. Filters are um, basically, you know, like a where clause in SQL, and that's more or less what they translate to. And so, you can say, okay, give me give me the container requests where the name you know matches a certain pattern and it's in a certain state um you know from you know, containers let's see uh, anyway so it's 
you know, again, the Python SDK is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, you different you have different endpoints for container requests and containers and collections and so on and so forth. And um, you know, you call this, you'd say get something with a particular ID or give me a listing which matches a certain filter. Um, update a certain record, create a new record, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, example of getting the output of a CLL workflow. We have um, a cookbook section in, in the Python SDK that actually lists all these little code snippets for reference. So I'm going to go through this. All right. Yeah, so... All right, so I think we're to the, almost to the end of this. Um, so yeah, other material, the CLI. So uh, doc.ravanostore.org is the main documentation site. So it has a user guide describing how to use the workbench. It has an SDK section describing how to use the different SDKs. Um, has an API section describing what all the different method calls are available um, and different different resources and endpoints. Um, it has an ad administration section, you know, how to run a cluster. It has an installation section, and so on and so forth. So, um, yep. So uh, there's the common workflow language that has user guide, the specification, all of that stuff. Um, all right. Okay, I think that, okay, so that's it for the Arvados training. Um, I can take some questions, and then after this, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, specifically how the um, sequence resource project is uh, using Arvados. So is there any, does anyone have any questions right now? Thank you, Peter. Yes, we do have some questions already posted on the questions and answers channel. Uh, I will allow uh, people to, sorry, I just saw a raised hand. So I just will allow uh, people to ask their own questions. We have two people, so I, I will unmute um, Michael Crusoe and Andrew. And I can see there some more raise hand from I'm allowing to Michael, Andrew, and Ambarish to unmute themselves so they can pose their questions. Michael, please go ahead. Let's going to start with you. Great. Hey, Peter, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, could we go back and look at that Arvados provenance graph? And, and I had loved seeing that and had a question. Does it automatically uh, connect provenance across workflow runs? Would it show you that you know this workflow output was used in these other workflows, perhaps run by different users? So yes, um, the answer the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, this uh, in You'll see that this uh, the tab is called provenance graph, but this is actually it's cut off. But this is actually a uh, collection view, not a um, not a particular workflow view. So, in fact, for any collection, you can click on uh, provenance graph. Um, so this is actually this is probably for the the very this box at the bottom, uh, Clinvar report HTML. So Probably what uh, so what somebody did was they maybe they found the the Clinvar report and they want to know how it was generated, so they click on the provenance graph tab. They're at the, so they're looking at they're starting from the collection that was the output of this workflow, um, not knowing what that workflow is, and then they were able to see okay these are the steps that went into actually generating this, and then used by is the inverse of that where you have something and you want to know what else is what what has it gone into so if you click on the used by tab you might see oh you know maybe you might see the next step of the workflow so this is based on knowing what set of collections went into a given um, 
container execution and then the identity of the collection that was produced by that container execution. Great, thanks so much. Um, Michael, you had another question. So if you want to go ahead with that one, we will then move uh, to Andrew who also had some questions. Sure. Uh, do the biohackathon.curie.com users have access to their Arvados virtual machines for the shell access? Um, they, they do. Uh, well, I, I, um, we were setting this up. On <laughs> we were setting this up last week. Uh, that was actually one thing that didn't quite get set up properly. So. Um, I, I was sort of looking to see how, who, who would, what the demand for using Arvados was going to be. Um, so it hasn't, it hasn't, it's something that still, it still needs to be fixed. So normally they would, um, at the moment, uh, one of the services required to make that work is not working, but that was just because this instance was set up in a hurry. Got it. I just want to say expectations for people. Yeah. They'll, I mean, be, I, I, they'll be up soon. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peter. Andrew, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself so you yes, can ask hello. some questions. Perfect. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you for the presentation. I have uh, actually a few questions. Uh, let's start uh, from a one and uh, it's related to uh, load balancing and uh, scalability. Uh, like, uh, is there any instruments uh, for monitoring uh, uh, jobs and workers during the execution? Uh, like, uh, we have a, re a real life example when we have some node, for example, and uh, it needed it, it needed a tuning by hand. Like, should I have a two instances or one instance, but multi-threaded and so on? Uh, it's related. Um, uh, is in general is related to how to get a full utilization of uh, CPU, MEM, and I/O. Do you have any tools to control this? Yes. So. I didn't really um, show that, but yeah, so we have, there's many different options around that. There's, um, so of course, when you're submitting the job, you can specify your, your RAM and your number of CPU, CPU cores that you want. Um, when the job is running, we're constantly gathering statistics on um, CPU load, memory usage, uh, disk usage, network usage. Those are all logged. Um, along with other, you know, whatever logs go with the, uh, the produced by the tool itself. And there's an analysis tool called CrunchStat Summary, which will then go through those logs and produce graphs um, and, and make some, uh, can make some recommendations to you. Like, oh, it looks like you asked for 16 gigs of RAM, but you only ever, you, you never used more than seven gigs of RAM, so maybe you should lower your, CP, your RAM request. Um, the third thing, so that's, so, so yeah, so there's tools, you can analyze your entire workflow that way. Um, and it will tell you for all your individual jobs, what, what, the you know, give you pro graphs and profiles about, uh, how each one individually used the, you know, how well it used the compute node it was on. Um, and then the third thing is that the services themselves, the keep store servers, uh, and, and other services uh, export Prometheus metrics. And so if you have a, a DevOps monitoring system, you can monitor the health of um, all these services uh, in as well and, and graph them and sort of see whether something looks overloaded or, or underused or misbehaving or things like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's it's cool. Uh, so as I understand, you have kind of intelligence system with the, um, uh, some advices. And uh, my second question related more to uh, DevOps, I would say. So 
so you said it can work on cloud, like, obviously, but it's uh, is it uh, cloud agnostic or it's uh, uh, some presets for uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Azure, and so on? Uh, I, this this question related is uh, to how to estimate uh, my computational costs. So first, I've got some optimization, but then I still want to know uh, which instances is uh, more suitable for my job and so on. Do you have any tools to, to address this? Um, so I, I feel like there was two questions in there. Um, so yes, it's cloud agnostic. Um, <laughs> it uh, supports... Google, uh, or uh, sorry, Amazon and Azure right now. Um, Google support is pretty easy to add, but um, we haven't we haven't done that. Or you know, we used to support Google. We moved, replaced a, one of our components. We haven't re-added Google support because it hasn't been a priority request right now. But um, yeah, so you can deploy a different cause, deploy it on HPC. Um, in terms of estimating costs, um, let's see. So well, so the the tool that I described earlier uh, that collects um, stats on on your uh, utilization, or that well, I say analyzes the stats that are collected about your utilization. Um, it also includes a record when it's running in the cloud. It also includes a record that says what node size it ran on and what the cost of that node was. So if you do some trial runs and you kind of get a sense of which node types you're running on and, and um, how big they are, then or which nodes you're using, then you can run this to like estimate your costs. So maybe you run your pipeline once, you say, okay, use these nodes for this amount of time and these other nodes for this amount of time. There's a tool that will, yeah, there will go through your the whole workflow execution and it'll estimate what the cost was of the entire pipeline by by you know looking at each job, seeing what node size it was on, and it, it reports it's what the cost per hour that node size was. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think it's enough. But uh, sorry, I, I have another question. <laughs> um, uh, on, the, on the project website, uh, you mentioned uh, that you have J4J standard support. And uh, what exactly do you support at the moment? Uh, I think the main thing is going to be the, the workflow execution service, Wes. Um, I actually have been involved in the cloud working group for quite a while. Um, like, I should say, I've been involved in the cloud working group from the very beginning um, in, like, 2015. Um, although uh, for various basically resource reasons we haven't been able to be as engaged as we want uh, we do want to support uh like drs um the tool tool registry service like uh, other g4gh standards around authentication like these are we're all things we're aware of and we've been tracking um unfortunately we're just a small team and so we haven't had enough haven't been able to um give it the attention it deserves Okay, yeah, but Wes and Tess, I guess it's in the core of the world. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for me. Mm -hmm. We have another question uh, on the question and answer uh, panel here. And I also saw someone raising a hand. So I'm going to give uh, uh, the chance to talk first to the person that posted uh, the question. And then we will move to the person that raised the hand. So, Tasbo, uh, it is your turn for the question. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks a very good uh, talk, Peter. And uh, my question was uh, on the QRA chat, but I, um, I understand that uh, the Arbutus has a very um, uh, and many many good features for uh, the scalability, but. I, um, I was just wondering, uh, in what kind of use case does the keep storage system work more effectively than the normal storage? So it splits the file to the blocks and uh, stores in the 
very obstructed way. I think, I think that's very smart, but uh, um, I, I just want to know uh, which use case it's perfectly work and it's perf um, um, I, I also want to know how fast it is. Okay. So um, I would say, so the, the cases that it works well for, um, it is is when you have sort of very large, so it, it's designed to, to scale well with very large sets of files um, to do things where you are, you're doing large, large batch analysis on large data um, and things have a kind of a copy and, you know, copy and update like a, you know, the, the sort of pipeline, you take files in, you're going to, you take data and you're going to create new data from that. Um, and also very good for sort of archival purposes because again, everything is, um, has these hashes for, you know, content addressing. And so, uh, if you're sort of storing data in the long term, it, that really helps you um, ensure that that hasn't, you know, it hasn't isn't changed, isn't corrupted. Um, the I would say what it's maybe not so good for what you wouldn't run, you wouldn't want to run directly on Arvados is something that's really read write intensive, like a database. Um, I mean, Arvados itself runs on a database, <laughs> but the, the, the keep system. Yes. Can interrupt. Maybe you can give some real-world examples of how Arvados is being used today. I think that that will help. Yeah. Well. Okay. I mean, it's. Um, I'll say. Well, we have one one customer that uses several customers that use it as their like um, source of truth. So, like all of the data that they are sort of storing long term. Um, they put in Arvados because it gives it's uh, yeah sorry it's uh, hard to be a little more specific because I can't <laughs> I don't I, I can't talk about Curie's customers really um, they don't want to be talked about um, but so the two main the two main use cases has been I think people who are uh, the organizations which are using it as the the principal source of truth that other things reference um, again because of the strong uh, ways that you can identify the data that's been put in the system, so archivally. Um, we also have, I didn't mention it here, but we also have a uh, versioning feature available, so an individual a collection can, can change over time, um, but then track all of its previous states. Um, and then the other thing, the other use case is, uh, which is, actually builds on this sort of archival use case is like a sequencing lab. So uh, you're maybe in the you know, human sequence, you know, human DNA sequencing, you are collecting, and this specifically whole genome sequencing, you're collecting a lot of data. The data that you, the raw data that you collect, like the, or the FASTQ data you collect, you need to keep for a long time <coughs> because that's close to what the, uh, the equipment produced. But then you also have many stages after that of analysis and reporting. And so you're, treat, you're using the sort of archival aspects of the system to store the data that was actually produced. But then you're, and you are also using the computational analysis uh, elements of the system to produce all of the, um, all of the results that you're going to actually deliver to somebody. Um, and I think I lost Taz. Or what was Taz? Taz, or what was your second question? <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so, so archival um, feature of the keep storage. I think I think that's really great, and uh, so it has uh, the content address, and uh, which is really nice to uh, you know um, validate the data is uh, still there, and also the it's it's it's, um, it's not corrupted. But uh, so so you you talked about uh, the. Um, the key storage split the, the one file into the chunks of the data, and then so so what what is the main reason of of the the chunky and making a chunk of the file and uh, putting the storage? And I th I thought that it's it's because of the scalability and the performance of the storage system. Is it? Yes. The, uh, yeah. Okay. This, it it's well. It gives it gives a unit that everything. This is the unit of deduplication. So. 
it's the, the, the individual chunks are, are content addressed. So if we have the same data, we'll have the same content address, and we don't need to store it more than once. Um, or it means we can store it in several different locations, and when we ask for it, we know that we're going to get the same thing back. Oh, OK. So you can save the storage space as well? Yes. Oh, OK. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. I, one of the things we're actually also working on is um, uh, we call them storage classes. It's it's basically sort of a heterogeneous storage or multi-tiered storage where uh, data can actually be moved maybe from a, a hot store to a cool store, so something that's less expensive yes. that's uh, you know accessed less frequently um, to sort of save, especially you know different cloud providers offer this as a cost saving option, and so. Um, Again, the all of the identifiers are the remain the same, but you now know you, you move the data to a lower tier, um, you know, to a different different sort of class of storage in order to save money, um, and the system doesn't uh, you know doesn't have any problems with that. Mm. Okay, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We had another raised hand, Ambarish Kumar. You raised your hand at some. Uh, yes. Hello, Thank Peter. You. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I would like to discuss about the scalability of workflow, bioinformatic workflow, uh, while running command, uh, common workflow language over uh, Arvado. So I would mention that many uh, bioinformatic tools are not enabled for the HPC, like Spark, Map, MR framework. GTK4 is enabled, but SAM tool, Botai uh, tools are not enabled. So it is likely that we may not be able to uh, achieve scalability of the workflow, which involve multiple tools. So how to resolve those over the CW and Arvado platform? Okay, well, this is a pretty <laughs> this is a pretty broad question about uh, bioinformatics in general. Um, I mean, the the these these the approaches for scalability involve chunking up the data and that you know splitting the data up into pieces you know units of work that can be distributed across many um, many nodes so I know uh, again from the workflows I've seen that do whole genome sequencing um, in, or whole genome analysis at scale um, they will go and split up the Chromosome, like so, you don't. You of course you could so you can divide it up by chromosomes, but then you know you still have a the first you know some chromosomes are much larger than others, so um, you can further uh, split those up. I think by uh, if you have like regions in the data which are reference that you. Um, you? Don't you can sort of pre-process to say, okay, this doesn't look very interesting. Um, I don't think I'm going to find anything interesting here. I can split that, and so you can actually split it into a lot more than just 23 or 24 pieces um, in order yeah. to get more, um, in order to get more more parallelism out of the analysis. So I think I think when the the workflow I'm thinking of, it would ran at something like a hundred nodes at a time. Um, for like an hour to do, um, I think it was variant calling. So it was a hundred hours of variant calling, but done in one hour with a hundred notes. Yeah. So, okay, that's that. And also one more, one more thing. Uh, like as a PhD student or as a bioinformatician, if I would like to extend it as a project research work. Uh, what is the scope or what is the area into which a bioinformatician can work over it? Am I clear? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. If I extend it as my research work into my PhD study coursework, then what is the area, what are the area over the Arvado platform on which we can work over? I see. Uh, as a, a bioinformatician or a computer scientist, like do you mean yeah. the Arvados platform itself? Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I would say one of the things that that uh, would be a very interesting area. This is more again more of a computer science question, but would be um, 
uh, federated scheduling, like scheduling across multiple uh, sites or multiple instances. So we have, I, I didn't talk about it much, but uh, we have some, some several features where the um, different Arvados instances can actually talk to one another um, and say, uh, for example, I want to access a collection. It's not on the site. It's not on my local Arvados instance that I'm talking to, but it has been federated with maybe two other Arvados instances. It will actually go out and ask those other instances, oh, do you have this collection? And um, it can actually stream the data from those other instances, or you can send work to those other instances. So uh, we have kind of the, the basic features for that, but not the like scheduling on top that would really allow you to do, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, try to optimize how you would allocate jobs across different sites to minimize data transfer or expense or, you know, maximize compute resources. Yeah. So that that's that's one thing that comes to mind. If you have, you know, want to talk any, about is there is there any example? Yeah, is there any example of active project which is going on over a Wado platform? Like any active area of research which is related to a Wado platform? The platform itself? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think it's it's we we developed the platform. Um, I don't know of any academic labs that have been academic labs that are working on the platform itself. Um, okay. Well, we, so, we have this TWL, of course, but I think, I think yeah, we should yeah. move on, Peter, to um, yeah. your presentation. Yeah, yeah. So this is right. We were already 14 minutes over. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> and you so much. I have, yeah. So let's, let's, okay. So uh, let me take a few minutes to talk about uh, what I've been doing this week with the uh, public sequence resource. Okay. All right. So, all right. So that's so to get specific for just a moment. Um, this is the Arvados instance that we've set up. Um, this is this is when you come in. Uh, this is the dashboard. It gives you a summary of what's been going on recently. Um, so this includes the recent um, executions of workflows uh, with their outputs. Uh, what some of the things that have been running, the containers, uh, sorry, what, what is currently running, so nothing's currently running, and also some of the collections that have been created recently. And um, I'm an administrator, so I can see everything, so you might not see as much, but if you log in. Um, and then I've created a COVID-19 Biohackathon 2020 shared project, so everybody will see this in their projects menu. Um, the Project pages have a description tab, so I've given some information here. Um, in particular, the Arvados training is right here. This is a link to the PowerPoint file that I, or sorry, the PDF that I gave earlier. Uh, all right. So now under subprojects, we have the public sequence resource. And again, I've tried to summarize kind of what's going on here. Um, all right, so the, the goal for anyone who's not familiar, um, the goal of the public sequence resource is to be a place where uh, labs can update, uh, can upload sequencing results from SARS-CoV-19 uh, virus samples. Um, we will then take the data that's been uploaded um, analyze it, and then add it to a pan-genome, a uh, genome graph of all the data that's been added to the system, uh, and run a number of other um, analyses on, the, on this pan-genome that are being contributed by various people. So uh, it's, it's really cool because we're getting, a, I have, I've been working on the orchestration and then an, of integrating a number of workflows contributed by different people. Um, and so, like this, it's this really great, you know, biohackathon project because we have uh, Rutger Voss working on phylogeny, and somebody's working on an assembler. Uh, somebody's working on a seek, you know, alignment to reference, and somebody, uh, Eric Garrison's contributed a workflow, of, you know, the, for constructing the genome graph, and and there's other stuff going on besides. So it's just really, really neat. 
Um, so let me talk a, a little bit about how this has actually been being put together. Um, so underneath here, we have uh, several projects um, when something is uploaded. So there's a, there's a, a back up a second. So there's an uploading tool, it's a command line tool that, um, that I wrote uh, earlier this week. So it's at this Arvados PH20 seek resource um, GitHub. So there's sequence uploader tool. Um, and so it uses the Arvados SDK to upload to this project called Upload Staging. Um, in addition to the uploader command line tool, there's this sequence analyzer script, which is um, basically a service that is <coughs> pulling the Arvados SDK, or, uh, pulling Arvados to see if there is something to do, ready to do. So you'll see here it has a their, their command line arguments, but it has a bunch of project UUIDs that have been coded in as like a default. So these are con corresponding to these projects here. So the upload staging project, um, the different runs projects. So when a project of, arrives in upload staging, oops, um, Right here, it's it's asking the up it's asking upload staging, you know, or, uh, it's quer querying upload staging to see if there's any new collections have arrived, um, and then for each of those collections, it'll validate the upload. Um, whoops. Validating the upload um, checks several things, including if it's a uh, fast Q file, not fast A. It needs to be. Um, it needs to be processed through the um, FastQ to FastA uh, pipeline, which is right now is just an alignment to reference. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to bounce around here, but anyway, the gist of it is that this this script is doing the orchestration of uh, noticing that a file has appeared in a certain project, starting a workflow. Uh, noticing when workflows have completed, taking the a result of the workflow, and then moving that somewhere else. Um, and in particular, they're being accumulated in this validated sequences project. And so these are the these are validated. In this case, means that the the um, Analyzer script has verified that it has metadata. It looks like a FASTA file. Like we we believe that that this is a, we've done some checking to see that it looks like it's a legitimate thing, um, not just a picture of a cat or something. Um, so once it's moved into the validated sequences project, then it runs um, the pan genome workflow that's been. That we're being that we are developing. So the different workflows here are in. So this is a viral analysis project that was started for Biohackathon. So here's our FastQ to FastA project um, workflow. That uh, again, it's an alignment to reference workflow, and then the pan genome generates so uh, workflow. So this is going through these various steps to um, actually produce a genome graph. So it will, so what it does is it will, it takes every, right now there's only one thing in the, again this hasn't, this is not a live system because we're still developing it, but it will take every one of the um, collections that are in that validated sequences project and it runs them all through the um, pan genome uh, workflow, and that <coughs> that produces a result. the The result, the the orchestration script copies that result over into a a known location. So this is a 
this is a single, this is a fixed collection. So this collection gets updated um, when something changes. So I'll mention, so I just, you know, to emphasize that means, that means it's the same UUID in the database, but it's actually a different content address when it gets updated. Um, and so this produces the, the GFA ODGI, here's a visualization, um, and also an, an RDF of, the, there's also a, the ODGI is converted to an RDF format. Um, and that is, the, so that's the results that we have so far. Um, any questions? No questions? So Peter, um, okay. <laughs> can I ask something? Of course. Um, so we already have a heap of functionality in here, which is which is running through different workflows, and they're connected with each other. So we're getting an output which we can share. Um, uh, how hard would it be for someone to contribute a new workflow, you know, to uh, to 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 our father, so we can add it to the public uh, sequence uploader? So I've been, uh, is, it depends on where it needs to hook in. Um, it's very easy, this pan genome generate workflow, it's very easy to just add new, um, new steps onto this um, because it's just, you know, here's the, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just uh, you know, you just add another step uh, that would take the the results from some point in this um, in this existing workflow and add new outputs. So uh, it requires a minimum knowledge of CWL, but otherwise, uh, yeah, that that would be the place. If it's a pre-processing step, that's a little more complicated. Um, uh, well, you need the workflow, but then you may also need to add it into. Um, the orchestration strip to recognize that this needs to be processed in a certain way. Right. So the orchestration script ties it all together. Yes. Uh, and the people who have been contributing workflows so far, they've been they've not been developing on Arvados, right? They've been developing on their workstations. I guess. That's right. correct. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Any other question? I don't see raise hands, but I see some uh, some comments in the chat about features of the pandemic board flow. And uh, people looking forward to contribute with uh, new workflows as well. Uh, so maybe you will get more people for the project contributing and so on. That would be amazing. Any other questions for Peter? Please raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions right now. Peter, thank you very much for this webinar. Uh, thank you to the participants and uh, people posting comments, posting uh, comments on the chat and um, participating from this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, I will end the recording right now and then we will share it uh, later. Thanks all and please remember we have the wrap-up session tomorrow, 12 UTC. Thank you very much. <laughs>